2000, summer of 2011, PCSing from the Air Force Personnel Center to the Academy. Definitely was not expecting what happened. Um, it was, it seemed like a normal PCS season. You do all the stuff you have to do to get ready for the, for the move and make the move. But it was literally a, for me, it was a life, it was really a life-changing moment of what happened in those series of events during that summer. So we, we pulled into Colorado Springs on a Sunday evening and I began to feel the, the ground begin to shake emotionally. Uh, thankfully, not literally, Colorado Springs isn't known for earthquakes, but, but boy, my life began to really shake. And it, over the next three days, it actually probably, it felt like about an eight or a nine on the Richter scale. I didn't really understand it at the time, but actually it had been a series of events that had been building up over probably a course of about 15 months or so or more. Life events, could life events. All my kids got married, all in about 12 month period of time. Uh, my daughter, we found out that she was pregnant, which was awesome. It's going to be a papa, you know, going to be a, a, a grandpa, and so I was just thrilled. Uh, but there were also some tough things that had happened along the way too, to where we got to that summer, and uh, probably the big thing was taking on a new job as a wing chaplain, coming from the personnel center, and just uh, honestly just sitting there as the assignment guy, hearing hearing stories, both really good and positive and negative experiences of how our wing chaplains had, had fared. Some of their struggles, hearing, you know, unfortunately having to hear about how some had really struggled. To be quite honest, I was scared to death. And the, the, the thought that just really kept eating at me was, I'm gonna fail. I had nothing to base it on because everywhere I had been, I'd had some had great mentors, had people who had really set me up for this in a sense of training. I was ready for this, but there was this nagging feeling inside of me that I'm gonna fail, and I'm gonna let down all the people who had been in my life over the years who believed in me, and they were gonna figure out that I was, I, that, that I was a failure and that, uh, that I was a fraud. That was what nagged at me on the inside was you're going to fail. So that fault line became really overpronounced and I just began to really literally break. And I, for the next three days I didn't eat, didn't sleep. I was miserable. I just didn't know what to do. And it was on that third day, uh, and I, I have to say this, I, I just got to say so grateful for my wife who kind of went through this with me and spent literally most of those evenings, those nights, just loving me and caring for me, praying for me. Just so grateful. But it was on day three that I woke, it, well, did not wake up, but I just, I was in the, it was in a hotel room. And I just, I heard this voice, literally, I mean, don't hear that very often, but I literally f felt and heard something inside say, call Dan. I knew exactly what that meant because Dan Nagolian uh, was my former wing chaplain, retired. Just so happened that he was now living in Colorado Springs. Of course, we know he was there by, in my opinion, he was there by divine appointment. So I had his phone number. And so Joyce called, my wife Joyce called up Dan and Kathy and by one o'clock we were over at their house and I walked in the door and I'll do my best to try to keep, keep myself together because this is the ministry of chaplains. Because I knocked on the door and Kathy's first words were, it's okay, you're safe. Come on in. So I went down into the basement, into the man cave with, uh, with Dan and of course the first thing he wondered was, what in the world is going on because this was not me because I was crying like a like a like a baby and I'd been crying for like for about three days uncontrollably 
And that was, again, not, not like me. I tend to be very uh, composed, uh, which was part of my problem that Dan and I talked about in the basement. We went down there and over about two hours, uh, honestly, it was, it was a life-changing event. And once I, the ministry of a chaplain, you know, a safe place, confidentiality, you can be yourself and you can just be real and just be raw. And it was in that setting that I experienced the ministry of what we, what we've been giving to people for years and years and years, but firsthand experience of getting to feel that compassion, the love and the care of godly people. And so, uh, so anyway, we went down there for two, uh, for about two hours and he listened uh, and he, he knew me very well. And he began to just uh, kind of peel back the onion and began to tell me things that I needed to hear. You know, we hear f faith, family, and friends, and so often that comes off like a cliche. But you know, that became real. And Dan reminded me of those things. He reminded me of what is very important in our lives. And as we began to reflect on that, I. You know, my life verse had always been, and really has always been, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, about trusting in the Lord. With all of our heart, yeah. lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge Him in all of your ways and He'll direct our paths. I, I lived it, but for some reason, I had really become disconnected from that truth. And Dan reminded me of that truth. And he just encouraged me to get reacquainted with my faith. You know, here I, you know, I felt really embarrassed because here I was a pastor of so many years, a chaplain, loved people, you know, loved God. But somehow or another, my, I had really become disconnected. I had not spent enough time replenishing my soul. And as a result, I had become very disconnected from that very important part of my life. And uh, Dan very lovingly encouraged me, he said, you gotta get reacquainted in that area of your life and get that reconnected. Uh, but then, you know, the reminding me of, of the importance of family, which again, I, I am so blessed in that area. But friends, you know, I had friends all around me who, if I really needed them, I could have made a 911 call to them, but I didn't call them. And that day, I'll tell you, and since then, I've really worked hard on that area to reach out to friends. I've got a 911 crew, and in fact, I would encourage, you know, all of us to kind of develop that cadre of people who you can call. And so, uh, so thankfully, I've dug some, some deep wells since then, and I'm drawing on that nourishment. Um, I'm thankfully, I'm reconnected in those areas, and I feel so much better because I did. But I'm grateful for people like Dan who are available and they're ready to reach out if we will just make the phone call.